session during the um, the beginning of the talk, we'll have Stephanie speak with us about her work and there'll be uh, some images that she will present. Um, and then we do have ample time for questions um, and discussion at the end of the talk. And at that time, if you wanna pop up and um, ask a question, um, if you type in the chat that you have a question and what your question is, uh, we'll call on you and you can appear and turn on your video if you feel like it, you don't have to um, if you're doing something else, but um, that's kind of what we've been doing. So feel free to be, I don't know, video on or off during this part, obviously. It's not like a, a it's really nice to see people's faces then. <laughs> across the universe. Um, so today I am so um, excited and honored to have Stephanie Suchuko with us. Um, she is presenting new work for us at the university in uh, the Commons Gallery right now. And so we're gonna speak with her about that exhibition, um, which is the third chapter of the Out of the Camera Beyond Photography series that we have on view um, through the windows of the glass of the Commons Gallery. Um, and we'll also hear a little bit, I'm hoping about um, her reflections on the state of photography and on uh, her work and body of work as a whole. Um, Stephanie is, uh, let's see, she was born in the Philippines and received her BFA from San Francisco Art Institute and her MFA from Stanford University. Um, she has been included in a number of major exhibitions, including uh, new photography at the Museum of Modern Art, um, public knowledge at the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art. She is a recipient of a 2020 Tiffany Foundation Award, a 2014 Guggenheim Fellowship, and the 2009 Joan Mitchell Award um, for 2019 and 20. She was a Smithsonian Artist Research Fellow at the National Museum of American History, and she currently lives and works in Oakland, California, where she is a professor at UC Berkeley. Um, so without further ado, uh, welcome Stephanie. Thank you for joining us today. Great. Hi, everybody. It's really great to see everyone's faces. And actually, I am so regretful that I can't be there in person because obviously, you know, this, this exhibition and also the visit was planned to be in person. And I know things have switched uh, since then. So, you know, we're, we're making do with the best we can. And it's, it's really wonderful to see everybody. But um, anyway, this is gonna be, I think, a pretty condensed uh, talk uh, with Micah where um, I'll be presenting about, I think, 20 minutes worth of, uh, you know, the current exhibition and also related works. And then it's gonna be discussion and then the kind of Q&A afterwards. So what I'm hoping on is that, you know, we can get a really lively, uh, you know, kind of back and forth about ideas regarding the work and your thoughts about it. Because as Micah mentioned, um, this is the very first time that I've shown this work. So without further ado, I'm gonna share my screen. And can everybody see this? All right, okay. So um, here we go. Diversity or picturing diversity. And, um, you know, again, uh, I'm, I'm located here in Oakland, uh, and this is the very first time that I'm showing this work. And what do I mean, you know, by diversity pictures? So, you know, if you've traveled by the gallery, you've seen these large uh, kind of blank uh, color boxes, and in it are, um, you know, pretty straightforward text that appear to be describing things. And uh, I'll, I'm just gonna go through this uh, pretty quickly, but um, there's six images in the body of work. Um, it's just a, a snapshot actually of a much larger body of work that I'm still developing, but um, they're meant to be enigmatic. You know, I was hoping that on very first glance, you know, just looking at these images um, makes you wonder what uh, exactly is being described by this text. Also, the text is a little awkward um, which I find, you know, both humorous and also slightly troubling. Uh, Close-up face of happy multi-ethnic children embracing each other and smiling at camera. Team of smiling kids embracing together in a circle. Portrait of young boy and pretty girls looking at camera. Multiracial best friend taking selfie outdoors with backlighting. Happy youth friendship concept again racism with international young people having fun together. Azure filter tone. So, you know, what I'm hoping that 
visitors come away with is that notion of captions to images that you're actually prevented from seeing. Um, because what does laughing senior and multi-ethnic sports people putting hands together at park look like? Happy group of men and women smiling and stacking hands outdoor. Multi-ethnic sweaty team cheering after intense training. So, you know, hopefully in the back of your head, you're thinking about you know, what these images are or what this text is describing and you probably have a general image because you know, these are uh, pulled from stock photography uh, descriptions. And you know, stock photography itself lends itself to being um, you know, utilized in all sorts of commercial endeavors, whether that's you know, websites or pamphlets or magazines. And so you know, these search queries for you know, a top view or mixed race business teams sitting at the table at loft office and working, woman manager brings the document. These are useful images. And they're useful because they do illustrate things that people want to see and um, you know, ideas I think are uh, you know, promotable. Um, and this is a, a kind of snapshot of one of the early um, uh, exhibition uh, diagrams that I sent um, you know, when we were first developing the project. And the project actually came together quite quickly because I was thinking about this uh, for quite a while. And really where it comes from, and this is kind of funny, people of my generation will recognize this ad campaign. You know, I'm a child of the 80s. And in the, in the 1980s, there was this very popular uh, campaign from the, co uh, the company Benetton. And it was really known for having these very international, uh, multi-ethnic, multi-racial groups of people happily um, hanging out together in really bright colors. And you know, this notion of sort of like a global culture or you know, the world coming together in this very community-minded way was something that it promoted. Um, there's also, I think, something really at odds with that vision, though, because when we Think about you know uh, our present reality over centuries. Really, you know, there's always been conflicts, and there's always been you know sorts of um, vying for power amongst you know populations in the world, but also a lot of control over who wields access to the image making machine. You know, photography specifically, but also just you know what images are uh, proposed as you know representational of you know, our reality. And so this is actually a snapshot of uh, a stock photo website in which I plugged in diversity and up pops, you know, all these kinds of generic looking images. And everybody looks incredibly happy. You know, there's sort of this um, notion of a un, uh, unproblematic uh, community formed by our, you know, diverse global and international uh, population. Uh, I think they're great. <laughs> there are so many images of this type of, you know, togetherness. I also love the, um, you know, the watermarks that, you know, put on uh, the iStock logos that, uh, and Getty that, you know, populates all the images. And now we're getting into some of the actual images that were described by the text. So, I, you know, if, if anyone can recognize this is multi-ethnic sweaty team. Um, oh goodness, I forget which one this is, but it's almost, you know, it, they're super generic. And uh, I love the fact that, you know, they're, again, incredibly unproblematic. Oh, this is, yeah, the babies against, uh, you know, light gray background all looking in one direction. Um, and just to interject, maybe by unproblematic, you mean they are problematic, but they conjure oh. this. Um, <laughs> and paper over um, all of these divisions uh, and, and conflicts with this kind of this, this image that appears superficially unproblematic, maybe. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, I mean, I'm not by, by proposing this work and showing these images, I'm not saying that these are not, um, you know, ideal spaces in which, you know, of course, like, um, I think societally, it would be amazing and wonderful to come to a point in which everyone was actually on equal footing and also, you know, um, in a much better uh, position in terms of racial representation and justice and equity. But, you know, we're not there yet. And so the, the, the um, I guess the proliferation of these types of images to me are really interesting because they assume that um, they're, it, it, they assume that things are achievable or actually are already here. Um, and, and obviously, I think, you know, especially um, in the United States right now, 
you know, we've we've witnessed, you know, an, uh, the the kind of uh, the backsliding and a lot of things in place that have never changed in terms of racial injustice and inequity. So um, there's also this fascinating side. This has nothing to do necessarily with the images um, up at the gallery right now, but um, the stock photo uh, website also has a ton of photos of protests and they're blank signs that you're supposed to then put in a message of some kind as well. And so when you think about, you know, that you, on one side, there are these images of like harm, racial harmony. And on another side, there's images of protest in which um, you're not even exactly sure what is being protested. And you can kind of fill in the blank depending on, you know, your, uh, your desire, I guess. So it, I think it's great. And what, what's also fascinating about these images is that they're, they turn into color fields. You know, they're, they're actually, to me, kind of almost similar to the color fields of the uh, caption photos uh, that I'm showing in diversity pictures. Um, <laughs> pretty great. Can you can you explain that a little bit um, in terms of the the tone of the diversity pictures because each one does have this um, slightly uncanny sort of brownish pinkish tone. And yeah. where, where does that come from, and and um, how does that relate to the to the image itself? Yeah. So um, you know the the text itself uh, in the in the work of the exhibition um, is in front of. A kind of blank color field, and the colors are generated by a um, using Photoshop to color average the entire picture. So what it's doing is it's taking you know all the colors of the people, the background, everything, and creating its approximation of the color average. And you know for me that was also a reference of you know the notion of the the kind of flattening of the differences involved in you know creating an actual diverse uh, picture or representation because I think all too often American culture in particular is really invested in, in the notion of a multicultural reality without effort and what that does is it flattens everything it it um, it positions people into spaces of having to kind of toe the line of being um, both pleasant, you know, for the sake of unity, and to to forget or you know not uh, to assimilate essentially. So I I guess I see the color averaging as a kind of gesture uh, of assimilation. And um, all right, and so with that as a kind of you know backdrop of you know the work in the exhibition, I also wanted to share um, some of the previous photo related works that I think came to inform this, uh, the current project. So as you might see from behind me, I'm super fascinated with uh, notions of how the photo studio itself is, um, should become a, a form of focus. So, you know, a lot of the images created in say stock photography or even commercial photography is highly composed. You know, it's not necessarily naturalistic in the sense that there's a lot of effort that goes into creating the right conditions for a photo. So this is an image, um, you know, just from uh, amazon.com of a standard uh, photo studio kit. So you have the backdrops, the lighting, all the objects that you're not supposed to see that are actually in the periphery of the photo itself are now, you know, kind of in the center. And I use this image a lot to think about what it means to construct photos as opposed to think of them as naturalistically, um, you know, real. Uh, <laughs> this is also another interesting image. So, you know, the history of photography uh, is super fascinating because in, uh, you know, the early days of both um, analog and digital color correction and, you know, trying to make sure that uh, images were the correct color, there were all sorts of uh, uh, color cards, color calibration charts that were produced. And so, you know, in order to get the right yellows or, or blues or what have you, or especially skin tones, you were given these types of images to then, um, you know, check your digital file against. And so when I, I used to work actually as a graphics uh, and exhibition designer at a museum, and this was the image that they gave me to then make sure that all my photos were correct <laughs> in relationship to this, this shot. And it's a really interesting kind of parody almost. And I don't, I don't think it's um, meant to be a parody uh, of a, you know, kind of Carmen Miranda like ethnic figure decorated with fruits. And in her hat, it says Adobe, 
uh, because it was an, an early um, Adobe Photoshop uh, color calibration chart. So, you know, thinking too about, you know, in order to get the correct uh, colors in photography, you're asked constantly to look at images like this. And they become these sorts of standardized photos of uh, a kind of Western culture of either affluence or, you know, display. Um, there's always a lot of, uh, you know, color charts that also show different skin colors. And to me, they, they definitely become a, um, you know, kind of stereotype in terms of, you know, how we're supposed to look at these images. And they're also incredibly random, you know, so some of those objects that are, you know, put into these still lifes, they're meant to show off color, but then they become these really strange, unusual still life uh, constructions. And again, I'm fascinated by these because these are not uh, the center of the photograph. These are images that are used to produce other images. Um, and you know, the they were traditionally also uh, known as Shirley cards, but the the cards that uh, or the the color calibration images in which you'd have multiple, um, usually a woman, and in some cases also multiple, multiply racialized women. Uh, so that kind of work though, where, it, you know, in thinking about um, photography, uh, the one of the first I made kind of uh, in relationship or in opposition to some of these standardizations and tropes was a photo series called Cargo Cults. And this is um, from 2013, 2016, in which I was uh, creating these uh, faux ethnographic ethnological um, images of kind of fake Filipino tribes, all in black and white, but using um, uh, items that I was purchasing from the shopping malls that looked vaguely ethnic and then styling them, you know, to kind of look like these uh, uh, very exotic uh, uh, depictions of native Filipinos. And then after uh, styling them in my studio, I would return all the objects, uh, all the clothes back to the stores to receive uh, full store credit. So you'll see, you know, listed items from Gap and Anna Public Forever 21. And, you know, for me, it was this uh, playful, critical look on, you know, well, what, when we look at images of, you know, foreign peoples, what do we want to see? And what are we expecting to see? Um, you know, this is an image, it's uh, on top of my head is a black cheerleading pom-pom and there's around my neck are uh, uh, belts from the gap. And you can see all the price tags still left on there because obviously I had to keep the price tags on in order to get my money back after I returned all the, the props and clothing back to the stores. Um, and I, I guess I'm gonna just kind of quickly go through so we have enough time to talk. And actually, Micah, feel free to interrupt me too. Like, you know, we can fold in the discussion as we go. Um, there's only, there's two more uh, short projects. And one is, uh, again, photographically based, but they consist of interventions in um, archives, uh, specifically American colonial photographs and documents of the Philippines um, from around the turn of the century. So it's kind of like a, um, unfortunately, a, a forgotten fact in many circles, but the, uh, the Philippines was a United States colony um, after the Spanish-American War. And uh, as my uh, um, artist uh, residency at the Smithsonian uh, helped me gain access to a lot of photographic archives. And I was always uh, wanting to intervene in them in some way, because, you know, the notion too that, you know, photographs are, um, they're historical in many ways, but they also, I think, wind up uh, subjugating and subjecting people to the same racist narratives, even in a contemporary sense. So how can I somehow interrupt that? And so I rephotographed. this is within the archives itself in um, St. Louis, Missouri. I was rephotographing images of uh, Filipinos who had been imported um, into the St. Louis World's Fair in 1904 to kind of perform in a human zoo. And I was blocking uh, the vision um, and not letting uh, the viewer consume their, um, their identities yet again. So this is the, uh, from the project Block Out the Sun uh, over 30 images in which I'm, I'm literally kind of re-editing the viewer's ability to look at things. And then lastly, um, again, this relates to photography, but also sculpture and installation, um, a project from uh, just a, over a year ago called Dodge and 
burn. And much of it pulls from the language of photo, uh, like still lifes or studios or, or backdrops even. And it's um, hun a, a little over a hundred objects um, in a display that talks about the history of photography and colonialism and how those two things intersect, um, especially uh, in the Philippines. So I don't go into it too much, but you can see that I'm looking, I'm pulling, you know, the chroma key green backdrop, which is used, you know, similar to what I'm doing right here as a kind of a blank uh, backdrop in which you can project, you know, lots of different things onto it. You'll see, you know, skin tone, uh, cosmetic charts, um, different forms of like museum uh, collections downloaded into the installation, tropical fruit, uh, emojis of fists and poops and flames littering around, color calibration charts, and th these like um, baseball caps and tiki torches, which are uh, in chroma key green and also reference the kind of, um, you know, the invisible white supremacist, you know, uh, kind of, uh, the things that are always there in our backgrounds, I think, but you're not supposed to see or you're not um, uh, told to see them. So again, it's a little complicated, but um, you know, this this installation for me talks a lot about both photography, but also you know, expectations of uh, of what of how images are trafficked today. So with that, I think I'm gonna. Um, this is the last image, and maybe Micah, uh, maybe we can. Uh, uh, set me on to whatever you'd like to. Yeah, let's let's chat for a bit. And while we do it, maybe people who have questions can type them into the chat and then we can um, start to have a more open dialogue with the community. Um, I guess the first question, uh, I just have a few that I wanted to ask you um, is how you see uh, your work in relation to, <laughs> to the medium of photography. Um, I see you working, you know, obviously with photographic archives um, and uh, with photographic technologies to a certain extent. And it seems to me you're doing a lot of deep thinking about photography. Um, so I guess, how are your practices reflecting on photography and how do you feel they're of it? And how do you feel they might be also separate from it and using um, some other uh, visual languages to, to, to think about photography? Yeah, so one thing I want to share is that, so I don't come from a, a photography background, um, you know, photography or actually what I would say image making or even image trafficking is something that I've become really interested in um, probably for the last, um, oh goodness now, I guess almost 10 years. But it's really in thinking about how it, the construction of images are so implicated in how we think about both ourselves as individuals and also our, our um, society, like how we picture and envision, you know, what we're supposed to look like. And that, you know, with, uh, especially looking at archival images, um, you know, one thing that uh, you and I briefly talked about, Micah, was how there, um, how photography is also implicated in um, capitalism, in the sense of, you know, the stock photography, those images are for sale. You know, like those are those are literally those images have value and they're trafficked and they're bought and sold because there's value in what uh, diversity those images of diversity depict. And to me, that's really interesting. And also, when I think about if I go back a couple images and I think about how um, the uh, let's see, what is it the Oh, okay. So, and and these images too are still, I would say, trafficked. Like the original images, you know, like we we constantly have to look at historical photos, and um, you know, because they are part of you know the document and the history, and yet we're always having to kind of um, uh, deal with a, a racist and colonialist vision attached to it. And I guess the question is, is if we can still do that critically, or if we've actually just sort of come to normalize, you know, these that these images are just part of the record. Um, I think that that can also, that's such a great answer and can also provoke other other questions from people um, in the department. Uh, yeah, I mean, I absolutely was thinking 
looking at your work about how photography and high capitalism kind of came into being at, you know, you could say rough around the same time, or at least the first half of the 19th century um, in some ways, and how you your work helps us understand them as defining and articulating one another. Um, and then, um, you know, I guess was wondering what you see happening, I guess thinking of you as almost a sort of anthropologist of photography or um, someone working, you know, looking at the history of photography and looking at photography as a, as a form um, or an object of study, what, what you see um, that interests you about photography in this moment today um, that might be, you know, unique or a new direction or a new tendency. Yeah, well, I think so, because uh, maybe I, I take pleasure in feeling like an outsider to the to photography, because it is it's a discipline, incredibly disciplined, right? Like, I mean, I, you know, there are photo galleries, there are photographer photographers, you know, there's a lot of technique and technology involved in the production of, you know, uh, like, quote, unquote, good photos. And so coming to it from an outsider and realizing that the history of photography was really mostly the history of a kind of like Western and white vision of the world, you know, and that those two things, photography and colonialism went hand in hand in the justification and construction of these images. And so what's fascinating to me now is thinking that, well, if you turn the tables, like, you know, what, what could things look like otherwise? Like, how do you both block the history of photography, you know, and its definitions of what things used to be? How do you invent on it? And also, how do you confuse things? You know, like I actually see that, you know, the like, so the installation, you know, like this particular installation to me is is confusing. It's got a lot of objects and images that are in there, and also kind of contradict each other and talk about different things. And so it's not a straightforward delivery system. But if you go back to, um, I'm going to go back to uh, um, diversity pictures, you know, like they're so, uh, I'm sorry to go back. Like this image is so dumb, like <laughs> there's no image, you know? And so again, you know, to, for me, I, I uh, the, the notion that a photograph actually tells like the true story or a real story, or, you know, um, has some kind of, um, has all the meaning in it by denying the ability to have an image in here and have just the caption, which is, you know, this is literally the caption of that particular image. Like what, whose vision is this? Um, yeah, I see you as almost kind of resisting the reification inherent in the commercial image by issuing imagery altogether within this particular series. Um, and then I'm kind of amazed at its ability to still comment on the image uh, in such an eloquent way. Um, I guess one, I'll ask one more question and then open it up for a chat. Um, just because we have a lot of, I believe, BFA and MFA students with us. Um, and I've been thinking about this uh, with my own classes. Can you tell us about your own formation as an artist um, through the academy from undergrad to grad school and teaching and, and just kind of reflect a little on that path for us? Yeah, yeah, for sure. So, you know, as was mentioned, I'm also a professor. And so I work with a lot of, um, you know, students and trying to you know, support what they do. And I guess, you know, for me personally, like I have a sculpture background. So I spent a lot of time uh, building things and, you know, making installations and sculptures. And then after that, it slowly branched out to lots of different projects. So, you know, even though right now I'm in the context of a photography talk or a, or a photography exhibition, I have a lot of work um, also in say social practice or, um, you know, video, online projects, um, et cetera, et cetera. And I guess like what the one thing I would just share with folks is that we I'm so happy that we live in a contemporary art time now in which there's so much overlap between disciplines. Like I, I don't even even though I make artwork, I like to think of everything I do now as a project instead of a say, you know, sculpture or a photograph or what have you, you know, like that it's it's incredibly expansive. So I guess like yeah, I would just, um, in terms of my formation, I, I guess I just try to keep it as open as possible as to what mediums and materials make the most sense for the project. Um, thank you so much. We have so many great questions already. I'm, I'd love to get to them um, and maybe kind of transitioning from that, um, if we could start with Rebecca's question. Um, do you, Rebecca, do you wanna jump in and ask and, and 
dialogue with Stephanie that you can. Uh, yeah, thanks so much, Micah. Um, Stephanie, I'm such a fan. You're so awesome. Thank you so much for being here. Gay was like texting me like, you got to make sure to be on Stephanie's um, talk because we've been, you know, I've just been so stoked to have you. I mean, it would be awesome to have you in Hawaii. So that's that. I just wanted to say that. Um, but also, um, I, my question is really like practical about how you approach having these conversations in the classroom, because I think that's such a huge question for all of us. And we're all trying to understand how to improve the situation that we're in. Your work talks so much about white supremacy and the hiddenness of it and, and how it exists in all these different institutional spaces, the Smithsonian and whatever institutions you're working in. And I'm just wondering how you approach that actual, you know, conversation and pedagogical, kind of pedagog pedagogical question of um, how you're navigating that space right now, especially right now in Oakland and Berkeley, mm -hmm. 2020, Black Lives Matter. Oof, yeah, no, that's a, that's a really good question. And actually it's a, it's a tough one to, um, to answer because, um, you know the so part of my responsibility i think as a professor as a teacher and also as a as a working artist right like that's kind of um being a working artist i think is one of the strongest um examples in terms of being able to just be hopefully a um, an example of you know well this is what my practice looks like so this is how i try to tackle these things but in a pedagogical sense i think what's difficult is sometimes it's hard to gauge at what um, conversation all the students are able to, uh, uh, you know, start from the same place. And so I think that um, for me, the challenge has been um, how to both make work and talk about work in ways that don't um, essentialize, you know, the, the concerns, especially I think as, an, as a female artist of color. So one thing I feel like that is a real problem right now is that the assumption is that women artists of color, if you make anything that appears to be about your heritage or ethnicity, that it's it can become a very, I think, read as very essentializing. Um, in, and that, in other words, that um, I think there's a lot of pressure for artists of color right now to, um, to sort of speak in, in an authentic voice and you know represent all the voices that have been always you know not necessarily in the middle of the picture um again I, I don't know if i'm quite addressing the pedagogical question except that i i think it also depends on the student body like i feel really lucky that my student body at uc berkeley um you know uh, i think come from backgrounds in which they actually feel um, amazed that they see themselves reflected in the work and the teacher. And that's not necessarily something that I feel like I had when I was in school. So, you know, there's there's pedagogical example, but then there's also just like showing up in the room example. Thank you so much. Um, there was a great question from, I think, Yola on Phil's computer. <laughs> do, do you want to jump in? Um, oh, you have to unmute yourself. <laughs> oh, sorry. Uh, thank you. Uh, super interesting talk. Um, I was wondering, just sort of, uh, Stephanie, if you could re uh, reflect, you know, what kind of, uh, you, you've opened up this conversation about photography as a medium and, and you know, in its co colonial history, which you're dealing with. But uh, I've been reading, I don't know if you've yet encountered this essay on learning the origins of photography. There's a, a, you know, a new book out. I haven't read the whole thing yet, but by Ariella Azulai. But you know, uh, oh, you have it there. It became transparent for a moment, right? So, um, you know, this idea of, you know, uh, photography is inseparable from the colonial enterprise and that, you know, uh, uh, we, we need to sort of rethink the photographic act as uh, you know, kind of part and parcel of, of that enterprise. But I was wondering, as I was looking at your work, if um, it, you know, if if there, if it's always inevitably a conversation between the decolonial act and then this kind of uh, colonial enterprise underpinning or do you kind of envision a possibility for photography to actually kind of full stop 
be decolonized or you know not to have you know that that kind of like very painful history of you know like like uh, like the photographic archive being repressive will a future archive not function that way i mean i i one yeah that's a tough question i think one way to think about it is like if we've already had you know, um, X number of years in which photography was a kind of purview, you know, of a colonialist vision, we're going to have to have at least the same amount of years on the other end to counter that because the historical record. So in thinking about the archive and how valuable the archive is, and I'm thinking specifically about my time at the Smithsonian, you know, so I spent two months just kind of like excavating all these images. Stephanie. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Oh, a little, um, a little glitch. A glitch. Ah. Um, she did mention she she might have to restart her computer during the talk. Um, this, this is. I, I just want to thank you guys. This is such a great dialogue and such a great um, you know, community. And these are such great questions. And I'm 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 just gonna do a little soft shoe while we get Stephanie back on um, and say like, I'm so proud that we have 91 people here participating in our dialogue and community today from all over um, wherever you are calling, you know, home right now. And um, to, to thank the Lila Twig Smith Foundation for funding these talks um, and this series of exhibitions. And um, also mentioned that we have Sarah Greenberger Rafferty. Um, sorry, this is like a commercial break in the middle, in the middle of the discussion. Um, but to mention that we do have Sarah Greenberger Rafferty as the fourth chapter of the Out of the Camera Beyond Photography series, um, which has been exploring uh, non traditional photography and approaches to the photographic medium in contemporary art today. Her talk will take place on March 25th. It will also be a lunchtime talk. Um, so hopefully, uh, I'll send out an email, but hopefully we can have people back for that. We've also been posting information on the talks on the, um, on the department Instagram and other places. Um, so I don't know, I don't know. There's so, um, there's only so much I can really say because uh, Stephanie is the main event here. Um, but actually, I guess I was, uh, you know, wondering if Rebecca wanted to reflect at all as an educator about her experience talking about diversity in the classroom. <laughs> Not to put you on the spot, but while we're waiting. Oh, you're, pot, you're muted. Hi, sorry. <laughs> um, I mean, I think it's just a really, it's a, it's a huge question. I mean, I think all of us are probably dealing with this, whether we're in a position of teaching a class and leading a conversation or whether we're in a classroom and what you can bring up and what, um, you know, what people are available, what conversations people are available to get into. I think I, I really respect um, Stephanie's that just that just the idea of representation and the idea of who's in the room and who is who is the leader of the classroom right and who is bringing what what what's being brought to the table but that at the end of the day i mean the students also have so much power to bring that bring that to the table and and facilitation isn't just about um you know a teacher student dynamic in terms of like the person who's like you know the teacher telling the students what there is to learn, you know, there's like that one way dynamic, but I think I'm assuming, I mean, she clearly has experience like in Berkeley where her students are um, very engaged. I mean, I know Berkeley is just like an extremely engaged university campus too, in terms of social justice and movements historically um, for, for various rights from various people. I mean, ethnic studies basically emerged out of the whole movement for ethnic studies all over the United States emerged from Berkeley. So I don't feel like I have any authority to talk about this. This is just random reflection. But I mean, I think that it's worth the, it's worth having the conversation. And, and to get back to Yola's comment for a moment and just to like hold up this book, which I think is hard to see um, with the, the Zoom, but the um, here I can try to uh, undo the background. Um, I would love to have some kind of maybe like a virtual book club or something where we can read some of these materials together and think about what um, what some of these issues might mean for us um, and just talk about some of the the texts that are really meaningful to us as a community. Um, this is, I think, the the book based on the essay. But we have Stephanie again. Hooray! Welcome. Back. <laughs> Sorry, everybody. I got kicked off the internet. <laughs> 
<laughs> anyway, I'd love to jump in whatever was being discussed. I just I just went back to Rebecca and to uh, Yola's comments for a minute because I thought they were um, so so terrific. Um, but I think you were maybe in the middle of of a statement. Um, although if you don't remember, I, we can also just move on to the next question. There are a bunch of great ones. Oh, I think if anything, so yeah, my book, my copy also, which I keep handy, which is funny. Um, so yeah, no, Ariella Azule, amazing. And it was funny that um, I, in parallel to working on the these works in the last couple of years, I discovered her work and they almost seemed like, you know, they were going hand in hand at the same time. And so I found a way to kind of also justify what I was already working on using her text, which is great. So thanks for sharing that. Um, I think Gay, uh, no, I'm sorry, Jamie uh, had a question. She's a um, professor of contemporary of, and visual art. Stephanie. Oh, hey, Jamie. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think there's a lot of great ch questions in chat. So if you want to briefly address this, um, sure, go ahead. But it, it's also maybe related to Rebecca's question too. Um, I just wanted you to to maybe talk a little bit about the relationship of the stock photos of protest to citizen, because I know you were working with um, former students on that on that project um, in relationship to their own um, protest activities. Um, so could you talk a little bit about that? Sure. Okay. So yeah, Jamie's referencing um, a, a work I did in 2017, immediately after the, um, the 2016 presidential inauguration, where um, there were a lot of protests, uh, specifically at Berkeley also, and then also the kind of um, the rise in how the media was portraying this kind of left and right as kind of equal players. And so um, the, 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 um, the chroma key, actually, Jamie, just to uh, reference, you were asking specifically about the chroma key aspect of it or the, the staged aspect of it? The staged aspect of it and the fact that they wore masks um, when they were, when you, when you photographed them as a way to kind of protect their identity, which is, I think, so, to me, seems so different than the stock photos where their visibility as people of color are right there in the forefront, you know, I, I think I, I'm interested in the differences at play in those two bodies of work um, sure. and how you're dealing with the reality of the situation and in, in Citizen and all of the complexities. Yeah. Of yeah. So what happened in uh, starting in 2017 was this um, realization on everyone's parts that to be recognized at a protest uh, could be a weaponizing um, a proposition. In other words, that, you know, people were getting doxxed, which is the term for when your identity is kind of exposed, you know, in, into the general public and you're harassed. And so um, activists uh, were finding themselves increasingly the targets by being recognized. So masking up, which obviously, you know, has been uh, um, a tactic that's been around for a long time, especially with the anti-fascist protest, uh, protest movement, is, um, you know, uh, became more more prominent. So in the photographic series I did, I attended protests at UC Berkeley and was witness to uh, many of the um, anti-fascist um, uh, um, uh, 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 actions and wanted to somehow create images in response to that, but obviously couldn't photograph the protests and couldn't photograph people because that then leads them to be, you know, under um, potentially docs. So I restaged and re recreated portraits of them using my students as models. And so we collectively kind of um, uh, uh, thought about how to re-portray them using them as stand-ins. So they're, they're fictions in a way, but they're also meant to, um, they're meant to protect the uh, who we saw or what we saw, but to try to create a record of it in some way. And again, it's sort of like a, um, yeah, this, this notion of showing and not showing at the same time, which maybe comes up also in now the current images I'm doing where I, things are being blocked in different ways. Yeah, I don't know if that, that um, hopefully that answered a bit. Yeah, that's great, thank you. Um, just to get all the faculty out of the way, we have Gay Chan, our professor of photography, with a question. And then um, also Nania, I think, uh, wanted to kind of piggyback from off of Gay's question. So both of you. So I actually want to add something be before my question, because um, 
your Art 21 clip talked about how Dorothea Lange's image of I am an American influenced your, your banner piece. And then just want to make sure that Michael me Micah mentions that the upcoming Dorothea Lange show. So I think that's a real uh, yeah, great have, connection. Yeah, we have that image in the show. We have a uh, Dorothea Lange show starting at the John Young Museum in February and uh, uh, UHM campus community. Please come through. Um, and so, I it was a kind of a nice connection that we had. That okay. up. <laughs> it was yeah. definitely so my, my question was, uh, starts off in a very simple way, um, whether you fabricated the chroma key objects in Dodge and Burn, and I'm particularly interested in whether there are actually chroma key base log caps available in the real world as commodities, because that's very, um, you know, because it fits in so well with all your work, even from the counterfeit, from like, invisibility and hyper visibility at the same time. And, and mostly I'm thinking about the baseball cap, like how the invisibility of white supremacy in general, but then the hyper visibility of the recent insurrection. You know, so Ooh. I'm just kind of thinking through that. Like, so, so basic is, are, did you make those caps? Well, so they're not officially chroma key caps. They're just like, uh, what, what's the like emerald green? You know, like they're, so, you know, you can get uh, like most basic t-shirts or, or hats or ties or whatever in every color. And so I became an expert in sourcing anything that looks uh, chroma key green because, you know, I've done multiple um, sculptures now and installations where everything appears to be chroma key green. So no, they don't, they're not being marketed as chroma key, but they obviously, you know, can be or are. And yeah, it, it's, what's so funny is that when now I, I mean, everything is so, um, I think, visible now, at least I hope it is in terms of, you know, markers of say white supremacy or, you know, the things that are, were symbolically ignored for so long. Uh, because even, even just three years ago when I started making this type of work, it was illegible to so many people because again, you know, white supremacy is invisible. And so if you're talking about that invisibility no one can see the invisibility. <laughs> so I feel like the dialogue is slightly shifting, which I'm, I'm happy about in, you know, in a certain way, or I'm appreciative of, but um, anyway, no, thanks for that question, Gay. I, uh, they're, those, those exist, but they're not Trumpian chroma key hats in real life. And I think there are a few other people, Kristen and uh, Ninia, who could, you know, feel free to jump in. You were kind of just commenting on chroma key hats in various ways. Oh, hi. Um, I, I was just um, thinking about the technological aspect of, like, you said trafficking images. And that really, like, sparked my interest of, like, does the technology reference of your work have to actually work in the technological world, or can it just be referential? Ooh, uh, share with me an example of what you're thinking of with that question. Well, I mean, I mean I'm a low tech person. And when I think about like the chroma key green masks, like you can throw any image on top of those. And so do, do you ever want your work to like function that way or just to reference that that's an idea that could work? I see. Yeah. So in other words, like, will I ever project anything onto the um, chroma key? Because it works, you know, it, it can yeah. work. I've actually decided not to because um, so I had created an entire American historical garment collection uh, using chroma key green fabrics to also talk about sort of like the invisible hidden narratives of American history, like the lies that we kind of tell ourselves <laughs> about the founding of this country. And um, and I got a lot of suggestions of like, oh my God, you could, you know, put so much on that. It could be this vibrant, moving, you know, kind of thing. And I said, well, if I did that, then then I'm telling you what it what you think it is or what it should be or that kind of thing. And I really want the the chroma key green to be this open space of projection because the the reality for all of us is really different. And so what I've found in the last couple of years is that you can show different groups of people the same image and yet everyone's getting a different read on it, especially images of say protest or diversity or you know, any of the kind of charged you know, um, topics that we're thinking about now. It's, we're highly polarized and we're highly split. And so I've decided to leave it as, a, as an open field of projection. 
That's a really good answer that I, I kind of needed to attach to like the color because I'm like sensitive to just like what that color could mean. So thanks for that answer. Yeah, no, thank you for the question. We have a couple more questions about the, the specifics of the show. Um, I think there's Claire, are you out there? Sorry, there's a lot of questions. So going scrolling back up to get to these, Claire Bellock. Yes, um, sorry, my video camera isn't working. Um, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay. Um, my question, um, I was asking if there was any reference to censorship in the current UH exhibition and also the images of people protesting, um, but the words are taken out because um, also in the process, you're talking about um, the color averaging where you take the average tone and that's going to be your background color. Um, that whole process reminded me of when you're on the internet and you see like a trigger warning over a photo and it like doesn't show you the photo, but it'll say like, click here to see the photo, you know? Um, so I don't know, it just, the, the way the words are reminded me of like something being censored, like you can't see it. Um, so I was wondering if there was any reference to that in your work. Sure, yeah. So um, I think the direct uh, relationship to say censorship as a, as a um, uh, kind of, you know, tactic of, uh, of removing um, uh, uh, people's viewpoints, um, it, it's, it's related, but it's not what I was um, uh, directly referencing. So, you know, I mean, one of the problems I think is that, okay, if we think about say censorship or free speech or all these kinds of abstractions of like who gets, whose images, whose speech, whose ideas get to kind of hold platform, there's uh, the, you know the the right has kind of like taken that on as a as a, an ability to um, you know to to hold court and so when I block things or I don't show things or I don't show the images I think it's less about um, it's it's identifying that those images have power and they're not going to go away <laughs> I mean that's the thing right like me blocking a photo in an archive is not gonna change the archive, it's still there, but it's to just momentarily disrupt its ability to still keep um, you know, expressing its original intention. And the same with those stock photos. So unfortunately, you know, all stock photography is this huge field of, uh, of consumer, um, you know, consumed images, and that's not gonna stop either. So um, it's, I think censorship is, is a much larger, um, uh, uh, tactic. I think censorship is usually uh, from people in positions of power to then take away voices that are from below. But if you reverse that trajectory, I think, you know, what I'm doing is, is not censorship. It's, uh, it's not referencing that. It's referencing a kind of talking back. It's like a refusal. And so you can think about that too. So one of the aspects of like, you know, the labor movement like one way you can say no to a system is to refuse to participate or to refuse to work. So I'm trying to make those images refuse to work, I guess. Got it. Thank you for that clarification. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for the, that, that's a good question though, because I get asked that a lot. Well, you know, is your work, are you censoring? Are you, um, you know, denying, you know, free speech or removing people from, you know, the equation? We have so many questions. Um, I'm not sure we're going to get to everyone, but going back up to the top, Erica Falcon had another question about the exhibition. Yes, um, I have a question. Why did you choose some, um, or what, why did you choose, or what inspired you to like express this kind of subject in your artwork? Ah, you mean like the diversity pictures uh, work? Or just well, based, based on what I can see from your like work, it talks about like giving like protesters and pretty much everybody in different races a voice that their their lives do matter, and giving them power to like mm -hmm. express themselves. What made you decide to like express that in your work? Well, I mean, I think because. Uh... You know, for me, maybe it's personal, right? You know, like thinking in terms of like my own sort of like ability to try to represent, you know, whether with it's as, 
you know, a person in society or, you know, my place in it or, um, you know, even like what a Filipino person is or should be like or what images of Filipinos look like, you know, like, you know, different images come up in, in people's heads to represent, you know, all sorts of things. And um, so I guess it just dawned on me or I got more invested in how images and the production of images uh, are incredibly powerful. And so are there ways to disrupt, you know, a kind of uh, transit or trafficking of those images? And yeah, I guess it's personal, but it, but I'd also like to share that this work isn't about me, you know, like I'm, I'm not seeing it as autobiographical. Um, it's really about how a larger system has been put into place to um, limit, I think, the way people are represented in real life. Um, we have a, a question from Forrest about, about that relationship between image and text and like, um, Forrest, are you out there? I don't know if you want to. Yeah, I'm here. Um, so I'm, yeah. Um, so I'm just curious, like with the commercial aspect of these images, do you see these, um, the descriptions of them having commercial viability as well? Like, where do you think that text falls in this landscape of capitalism? Oh, well, so that text, I, so the, the captions are hilarious. I mean, they're just like, I, I spent like so much time just, I would just click on, you know, all these sort of weird generic happy images and then whatever was typed in, it, it, it was like a surprise sometimes. And so, you know, those, those, the captions are, they're meant as, they're just a quick read, you know, they're a quick take, they're, uh, uh, you know, words that might be typed into a search engine to come up with their assumptions of the, so the captions are all written by the photographers themselves, which I also think is interesting. So, you know, that's not a, it's not like um, the stock photo site is, uh, is writing them, or at least the ones that I pulled up from iPhoto. Uh, uh, and so that positions the photographer already into what they think they're seeing or what they think they're making an image of. And uh, so I don't, I don't, I'm not quite sure I understand what you mean by if it has, if the text has a similar amount of commercial capital, except that it, it definitely represents a viewpoint on what's happening in the image. Like what the image is good for, <laughs> right? And, and like what, why one might, might wanna buy that image is because it depicts happy international, you know, multicultural students. Did that answer Thanks. your question, Boris? I, I yeah. guess that question is also kind of about a crisis or like the relationship between word and image and maybe which holds the power, which um, in this case hold, has the, the value um, in a system of, of, you know, in a very visual system. Um, I think what you said answers Jake's question pretty well too about the authorship of the images, like are, of the text captions. Are they taglines written by a computer? Um, is there a person behind them? So yeah, that that was. Yeah, and from what I've heard too, anecdotally, and I haven't done any research on this, but a lot of the images, a lot of stock photography actually comes from Europe, and so that's interesting. And that you know, so there's a slight difference also in perspective of what diversity looks like or multiculturalism because I think America also has its like very particular you know visualization of those things and so the captions I think kind of reflect that and then sometimes they inadvertently like I, I also notice so multi-ethnic gets the, the words get interchanged wrong you know like mixed race like mixed race group you know, and you're like, wait, is everyone in the group mixed race? Or no, you just mean that everyone's a, a different race, you know? And so there, you can tell then that that's not written by somebody who is mixed race, right? Like there's a there's that positionality in there that it's, it, it betrays the, um, the, uh, the identity of the writer. Um, oh, so many questions, so many comments. There's a whole thread about baseball caps that I'm gonna bracket just to get to Phil, uh, Phil Young's question because um, he teaches uh, photography and the history of photography. Um, so ask your question, Phil. <laughs> You're oh. muted. Mute, unmute. All right, I don't, I don't necessarily teach the, the history of photography, but before I go into my color class, I like to talk a little bit about its origins. And I just found this semester, in particular, with everything going on, 
trying to look at the history of its origins and expand upon it being more diverse, but I just found myself finding, you know, one after the other, it's like a white male, white male, white male, in terms of trying to exemplify its origins. And basically, you know, what we have to look at in terms of showing students the work and its histories. I'm just kind of curious, Stephanie, if you had particular materials or books that that you've looked at in order to try to expand upon that. I mean, I try to talk to the students about the context and let them know that what we're seeing and why we're seeing all white males, you know, but I'm just kind of curious. I mean, we do go into the Shirley cards and I talk to them about, you know, the bias of early film emulsions and we talk about all that, but I'm just kind of curious. I mean, it's really kind of tough to, especially when you go back to like the fifties and the sixties, it's really tough. I mean, you can find white females like Helen Levitt and like people like that. And of course, um, you know, but it's tough to find a lot of it, people out there. Yeah, and so I think what I've turned to especially is, is just then looking at, um, well, there's studio photography in say, you know, um, uh, post-colonial countries, which I think is really fascinating. And so, you know, those names aren't as easily um, recognized because they're, they, you know, commercial portraitures, uh, you know, in which then people had a hand in kind of creating the image or, or, you know, situation that they're in. But um, yeah, as speaking as a, as a professor, so I did teach a digital photography, intro to digital photography one semester, and I was trying to find like um, tutorials for students to just look on, you know, for like Photoshop or shooting. And it was horrible. Like it, it was all men photographing beautiful women and like <laughs> touching up their faces. I mean, that's all the tutorials were about. And so I struggled to find um, uh, photographers. This is all tutorials too. This isn't just about, you know, uh, names of fine art photographers, but people who are actually like showing other people how to do things online. And I found like, I think uh, just two that I thought were good, you know, like uh, one woman, one white woman, and then one black man who were doing things, <laughs> you know, that weren't, um, that wasn't all, um, you know, just super conscripted. So yeah, it's it's tough. I mean, we're up against like 100 plus years of photography having been the purview of, of a very specific subset. So maybe that's why in the end, like I've been just looking at instead like thinking, yeah, who's been photographed instead, right? Like, so who's on the other side of the camera? And if they're, uh, if they're um, evidencing any form of resistance to the photo being taken of them, and then, you know, probably say in the last, you know, couple decades of photographers who've been, you know, now trying to create their own visions. But yeah. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's a tug of war because you want to show the students what's come before, what has been said, but it's also just, I guess, important to show it to them and then give them the context of what's happening within all of that. Does that yeah. make sense? Okay. Yeah, yeah, completely. Um, I, I want to be respectful of people's time, and I know other classes start at 1.30, so um, I want to kind of gently wrap this up. Uh, Nanea did want to mention that she's doing a statewide data project with the Hawaii Arts Alliance, um, and one of her project goals is to produce an image of what this network looks like. So uh, Stephanie's project has been really um, interesting for her, and she's written some things about that. Right, uh, Nanea, do you want to just uh, say something here? It's all in the chat. Unmute. Oh, sorry. The um the the personal aspect of everything, like your your work um, or artwork is looking at color too. And um my map online just kind of looks like a it looks like a drawing. And um, what that um, online drawing does is like it connects people. So it's a interactive map, but that's the image that I'm working with for like what diversity, especially of artists in Hawaii looks like. So just, just a comment. And then if anyone's interested too about looking at um, the CAN Hawaii Arts database, um, you can take a Google doc questionnaire and join the database and then um, my job and position right now is to plug everyone into the Kumu IO map so that they can um, network with each other. No.
but um the image of that or just like um kind of like trying to produce what a diversity image looks like and that's a, a really good um frame of mind for me so thank you what a challenge yeah yeah, thank you so much, everyone, for taking part in this discussion and contributing. Um, I, I think for us in Hawaii, diversity is one of the terms that's often thrown at us in um, uh, and as and as a descriptive. And I think it's so um, we we have so much to say. I feel like we could continue on with this for for another hour. But um, Stephanie, I really wish you were here. I really, really do. It would be so fantastic. Like, oh, um, I do too. I mean, the last time I was there was actually 2012, I think, and I had an amazing time. And so that's how I met some of the people who are here right now. And um, again, wish it could be closer. Yes, I feel that too. Um, thank you so much for sharing your work and your time with us um, and your thoughts. We'll have to think of a way to get you back here um, again. And thank you so much, everyone. Hope to see you again for another lunchtime. Uh, Zoom um, and uh, yeah, and, and, and be well and um, make sure you check out the show in the comments gallery if you haven't already. Wonderful. Great to see everyone. Bye. Thank you. So Thank you.